Hello, everyone. Thank you for making the time to participate in our first UK-Israel panel on climate change innovation. My name is Donna Hodge, and I'm the UK Director of the UK-Israel Tech Hub. We're a UK government team based at the British Embassy in Israel, and our goal is to help UK corporates and investors maintain a competitive edge through partnering with Israeli innovation and help position the UK as a partner of choice for the most promising Israeli innovators, entrepreneurs, and startups. Today's event is organized by the Prosperity team at the Embassy, including the Hub, Department of International Trade, the Science and Innovation team, as well as the British Council. We're here because we believe that an effective response to climate change requires clean innovation at a global scale. We believe that the UK and Israel, as two strong digital economies, can play a leading role in creating an environment for clean innovation to thrive. We set a very clear vision for this initiative. We want to bring the best minds from both countries to find ways we can partner, co-invest, and share knowledge to tackle climate change challenges. And we're hoping today's discussion to be the foundation for this vision. I want to ask the British ambassador to Israel, Neil Wigan, to give us some welcome notes and share, share why it's important for us as an embassy to be in this space. Thank you. Thanks, Donna, and thanks so much to you and, and Hadar and the rest of the team, who I know have worked really hard to put this together. Uh, and I'm delighted that we've got 150 people signed up. Uh, and a huge thank you to, uh, to our panelists, and I'm really pleased that we've got such a good panel. This is one of the first big events that the embassy has done since the coronavirus started, and that highlights how important this agenda uh, is to us at the British Embassy. Um, and that most obviously reflects the very clear priority that the British government has given this. Um, the clean growth agenda, uh, we've had a clean growth strategy since 2017 through our department for business, uh, enterprise, innovation, and science. Uh, clean growth is one of the pillars of our industrial strategy. Um, but recent events have highlighted the importance of that. As you will know, the UK is hosting the, the COP26 summit, the big UN summit on climate change in Glasgow next year. And that's one of the top priorities for the British government. It's one of our biggest international events. So all parts of the British government will be fully focused on that agenda. And of course, the coronavirus uh, has now created a huge emphasis on economic recovery, but our government and our prime minister have been clear that, that we need to grow back better, that green growth and green growth should be at the heart of the post-corona post recovery. So this is a really good time to be talking uh, about these issues. Um, and we really want to talk about these issues with Israel. Historically, Israel has been less of a, a voice on the climate change uh, agenda but we think that's changing already and we think that that's got real potential for transformational change. The strength of Israeli uh, academic and scientific expertise, uh, the obvious success of the Israeli uh, technology sector and all that that brings in areas from uh, mobility to clean energy to uh, efficient, en efficient use of uh, batteries and so on creates huge potential. And Israel's real success in bringing together uh, private sector, government, uh, academic research uh, to develop high impact solutions at speed, which is something we think the UK can learn from. So we think Israel's got a lot to offer and we think that the UK and Israel are natural partners, given our focus on that agenda and our complementary strengths in, in, expert, in, uh, in research, in science and in technology, as well as the depth of our financial markets and the size of our corporate sector. Um, so this is something that therefore that we as an, as an embassy will be treating as one of our top priorities over the next 18 months. And as Donna said, this is an effort from across all the parts of the British government represented at the embassy. So the, the UK Israel Tech Hub, which Donna works with, has focused on this agenda for some time. We've created partnerships, for example, between uh, Dyson and Breezometer uh, as a, in a quick example of clean growth but we see this as one of the strategic sectors for cooperation between the UK and Israel on the technology side. Our science and innovation team are working with the British Council with a new clean growth fund supported by the Wolf Foundation, which we hope to put into place as quickly as possible. And our international trade team uh, will be increasingly focused on the sustainable business uh, agenda. Uh, and I and the political team will be supporting all that work as well. 
So as an embassy, we will be absolutely focused on this agenda. We'd be very pleased to follow up uh, with any of the participants in the seminar uh, to see how we can work together with you in the future. Uh, so I'll now hand over to the real experts, the people you've uh, really come to, to listen to. Uh, and I look forward to listening to what I'm sure will be a really uh, interesting and informative seminar. Thanks very much. Thank you, Neil, and thank you for supporting our mission. Um, just to say that in today's discussion, we're going to focus on the role of policymakers, VCs, uh, large corporates and academia can play in accelerating innovation in the sector and how we can build an impactful uh, UK-Israel collaboration in the space. Um, and as, as a reminder, this is the first event uh, of many more. So hopefully we'll be able to cover more topics and more categories uh, in the near future. So before we start, uh, let's uh, start with a round of interest. Um, Richard? Oh, okay. Uh, so I'm Richard Templer. I'm a professor at Imperial College. I work in a number of places, but the one that's relevant here is uh, the Grantham Institute for Climate Change and the Environment. Beverly? I'm Beverly Gower-Jones. I'm a managing partner of the Clean Growth Fund. Um, the fund is £40 million that was launched by the Secretary of State um, at the end of May. Um, so literally a uh, very, uh, very um, young um, organisation. Um, to that, I founded Carbon Limiting Technologies, which has um, spent 14 years focused on commercialization of low carbon and clean technology. Avital. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Avital Eshet, and I'm from the Ministry of Environmental Protection of Israel. I work at the Policy and Strategy Division, and I uh, am head of the Economic Policy and Envirotech. Thank you so much, uh, Donna Hadar and uh, Mr. Ambassador, for this uh, great initiative. I also see very relevant and dear colleagues in the audience, so uh, I hope you have a very interesting uh, session, and thank you. Thank you, Avita. And Idan? Hello, I'm Idan Moore, uh, Investment Director at Centrica uh, Ventures. Uh, Centrica Ventures is part of Centrica UK, which is uh, one of UK's uh, leading energy providers. And we have a presence here in Israel uh, as part of an acquisition that was made in Israel five years ago. And later on, Centrica initiated uh, 100 million pounds of uh, venture investment fund to invest in leading edge technologies uh, and changing the way we live, work, and move. So we'll talk more about it. Uh, very excited about this uh, uh, webinar. Thank you, Donna uh, and uh, Hadar, and Ambassador, for supporting this uh, uh, initiative. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so today we know that active climate change can bring many benefits to our economy, our health, and our quality of life. Um, Richard, before we dive deep into our discussion, can you please share, share with us some high-level insights on why is it important for countries to invest in climate change innovation and how does that eventually contribute to economic growth? Um, and also, uh, how will that transmit into our new COVID-19 reality? Right. Um, I should have said thank you, by the way, as well, uh, to all of you for inviting me to come to this. But you caught me on the hop. I thought you were going to ask somebody else to introduce themselves. So um, thank you for um, inviting me. Um, I think the first thing I'm going to say is, 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 is how very recently things have changed. But in the more than recent past, um, people have often said, oh, you know, well, well uh, action on climate change is, is going to be an economic cost. And it's always irritated me intensely because you've always got to ask when somebody uh, asks the question what are the economic benefits of doing this is what do you mean by this <clears throat> and in particular in this case in purely economic terms are you going to account for the damage that you'll do the economic damage and other damage you'll do by inaction and very rarely do people actually account for the costs of doing nothing. And when you do, the question of why do this becomes almost immaterial because the existential risks of doing nothing are just too great. So I'd, I'd, I'd preface everything simply by saying that. 
you know, we're going to do this because we've got to do it. Um, okay, so um, what's happened recently, and by recently, I mean, I think it was last week, actually, or, or maybe a week and a half ago, um, your question was answered um, by McKinsey's, bless them, um, and they uh, published a study on green recovery from the pandemic. Um, and th luckily they had multiples of three, so I can remember this. So they did a, they've done some modeling and they said, well, um, if a European country, they didn't specify what European country, but a European country were to mobilize about 150 billion euros worth of, of, of capital for green recovery, it would yield something over 300 billion euros. I'm afraid I can't remember how much it was over 300, but it was over 300 billion euros of GVA. In other words, you, you, you double um, the crowded in benefit of, of this. And that you generate about 3 million jobs and reduce emissions by about 30% by the end of this decade. So you, you might now just want to ask, well, why wouldn't you do this? You've got people who are unemployed, you need to find jobs for them, and you know you're facing a crisis. For goodness sake, don't invest money in a recovery which isn't green. And I think that that's a very clear message and the ambassador has already, I'm just really echoing what, what, what he said. And, and it's interesting, those calculations McKinsey made um, did not include anything to do with economic losses uh, that might occur through an action. So these numbers are, if you like, the most crude, low-level way of looking at things. Um, and then I'm going to do something else, because I also think we sometimes are too obsessed by purely economic arguments. And when you go and talk to people, people who are not economists and not experts about what matters, and those, those concerns, by the way, have been heightened by COVID because people have experienced quiet, clean air, wildlife recovering, all these things which don't have, you know, a, a state of <clears throat> economic value, but they have an emotional value. Um, they have a value to do with what I would call a feeling of well-being and of prosperity. Those things are not accounted for at all. And I think that um, the generation, my children's generation, are as interested in those factors as they are in the cruder economic factors. So I think, you know, I cannot see a single reason why you wouldn't do this. And I can see every reason for doing it. And the green economy has the potential for leveling up, you know, for giving people better jobs, more rewarding jobs, and especially in the UK for taking away some of the disparity in the highest earners and the lowest earners, which has been very, I mean, the, the, the visibility of that disparity has been acute during COVID. So I think there are very many reasons for doing this and none for not doing it. Thank you, Richard. Um, and now moving to Avital. Um, Avital, can you tell us what is the Israeli government doing uh, from a policy perspective uh, to accelerate innovation in the sector? Uh, if you can touch also on what you're doing specifically on the mitigation and the adaptation fronts. Okay, so let me start uh, generally uh, saying that Israel, as many other uh, states in the world, is part of the UN uh, Climate Convention and, and as such, um, the are the national targets and they were submitted to the climate convention but in order to reach these uh, quantitative goals there are various programs and initiatives and market tools that uh, encourage reduction of uh, ghg uh, emissions um, in terms of market tools there are various uh, subsidies for energy efficiency and renewable energy and there's actually also a local tax on fuels, which is in principle reflects uh, external costs of uh, transportation. However, in our opinion, it is uh, too low and uh, it does not fully internalize the entire uh, external costs of uh, transportation, environmental and others. So there is currently a policy initiative to price carbon, uh, but it's not decided yet. It's a work in, a, in a progress. Um, that's about that. And um, 
also, you know, generally in Israel, we have a unique government agency that is highly experienced in uh, nurturing uh, research and development. And that is, of course, the uh, Israeli Innovation Authority. I must also mention that um, there is the Ministry of Energy and uh, they have their own scale-up uh, program that supports uh, pilot projects in, uh, in the field of uh, energy, energy efficiency, renewable energy, also uh, water and so on. Um, also, you know, in some programs, there is an extra benefit for um, innovative solutions. For example, we have a program to support energy efficiency in industrial plants and local municipalities. And this program proposes extra financial support on top of the regular support in case of uh, implementing a novel Israeli technology. Um, focusing on uh, promoting innovation in environmental technologies is relatively a very new business in the ministry that I work for, the Ministry of Environmental Protection. Traditionally, it is a regulatory ministry. It does not usually deal with economic incentive. So uh, to some extent, uh, the program that we have with the, with the Innovation Authority is a, a kind of a startup itself. I mean, my angel investor is the Israeli Ministry of Finance and uh, I assure you it's a very, very tough uh, investor uh, to convince. Um, uh, you, you mentioned at the beginning, uh, at the opening, about uh, uh, connecting, uh, um, supporting tech transfer from the academia. I think you mentioned uh, you mentioned that. I must say that, well, generally the Innovation Authority is supporting what we call the applied research, uh, which is indeed tech transfer from the academic to the industry. Um, unfortunately, the general uh, approach of the Ministry of finance here is that uh, in any earlier stages of uh, TRL it is better to work bottom up and not uh, to encourage uh, academic research on specific certain topics uh, in expense of other uh, fields. I'm not sure I agree with uh, this approach as in my opinion environmental markets are definitely characterized by being mar uh, marketing failure and they deserve their special treatment. But in the meantime, research teams, they can submit proposals uh, for support as part of the general support programs of the Innovation Authority. That's pretty much the situation. Thank you, Abita. Um, so now from Israel to the UK. Uh, Beverly, together with BASE, UK's Department for Business, uh, Energy and Industrial Strategy, You've launched a, a 40 million uh, investment fund to invest in UK's most promising early stage clean growth companies. Um, I know our audience is very keen to hear about this fund, uh, but just before that, can you give us a quick overview of uh, the various programs and support schemes that exist in the UK as of now? There's uh, an awful lot um, of support schemes existing in the UK because of, uh, we have such a long and strong heritage of accelerating innovation um, and uh, supporting clean growth. Um, I think some to mention would be um, the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, which was announced um, as part of the UK government's industrial strategy which has four key pillars, one of those being clean growth and another one being um, future of mobility. Um, so there's a, a partly a financial stimulus in, in form of um, grants and also uh, loans um, for, uh, for clean growth and innovative companies, both from universities and also um, from, uh, from, from spin outs. Um, some five years or so ago, the government uh, launched some catapult centres um, focused specifically on particular technology areas um, that they felt were strategic. Um, those catapult centres are set up to help support um, low carbon technology entrepreneurs with technology progress. Um, so to assist them, you know, develop their, their technologies um, faster and, uh, and, and um, more, uh, more efficiently. Um, and so um, that also really kind of enables and uh, helps the um, SMEs nucleate around uh, particular centres. Aside from that, um, the, uh, the, the government has been very um, 
uh, forthcoming in uh, providing incubation support or acceleration support to a number of the companies that receive grants. And um, so that commercialization support um, has been provided by carbon limiting technologies to the companies on the Energy Entrepreneurs Fund, which has really um, you know, provided that things like, for example, investment readiness work, things like um, helping find industrial partners for trial sites, and uh, and you know filling in uh, key resources in for for you know very stretched uh, teams. So I think um, that probably gives you a brief description of the different types of activities that the government's in, involved with. Thank you, uh, Beverly. We'll talk about your fund uh, in a minute, um, but I want to ask uh, Idan before. Um, on what is Centrica doing as one of the largest energy companies in the world um, to deploy technology as, uh, technologies at scale uh, to solve some of the climate uh, change uh, challenges and how does that basically fit or is aligned with your financial ambitions as a for-profit company? Yeah, so Centrica uh, as a company is, is known to provide electricity and gas, uh, mainly through British gas in, in the UK, but also through direct energy in the US. And uh, the one thing that has changed uh, drastically in the last couple of years, and specifically in the, and during the corona uh, time, uh, is the awareness of the customers. So customers are more aware uh, about their energy consumption you know, where, where it's coming from. Uh, they're starting to, to ask, you know, can I use clean energy? Uh, they have the choice. Not unlike in Israel, in the UK, they have the choice to, 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 to choose which energy provider that they're going to have. And uh, Centrica realized that we have to offer a variety of ways to offer uh, different types of energy and different types of tariffs. So if, so if a customer wants uh, green as a service energy, we need to be able to provide it. And in order to do so, we need to enable uh, the mechanism uh, to allow the customers to choose it. So for example, if we talk about home energy management, we're starting to deploy solutions that will allow our customers uh, to choose the type of energy, when they consume it, how they consume it, and thinking even for the future, maybe they can produce energy by themselves and sell it to their, to their neighbor, right? And that will help instead of transferring energy from one location to the other, you can do it in your neighborhood, which would be much more efficient. So these are the kind of, uh, these are the kind of uh, uh, projects that we're deploying at Nile. And this wouldn't be possible without startups. I mean, in order to do, to deploy technology uh, at scale, we need to start small, and we need to start small with startups that can show us the way. Uh, and for that purpose, we have Centrica Ventures, which is promoting investing in new technologies and promoting also collaboration with Centrica business departments in order to promote innovation and promote new services to our customers. Thank you, thank you, Idan. And I believe Centrica Innovation in Israel was um, ignited as an acquisition that Centrica made in Israel, uh, if I'm not mistaken. That's true. Uh, the, the acquisition of Panoramic Power happened in 2015, end of 2015. And two years later, uh, due to the fact that they saw a lot of innovation coming from the R&D Center at Israel, uh, they decided that they want to bring more innovation from the outside, not only from Israel, but from all around the world. There is a realization that, that innovation is not coming only from the inside of the company. It should be brought from, you know, with, wherever it's developed, whether that's in Tel Aviv or in uh, UK or in San Francisco or in India. Uh, we need to bring the technology and to apply it to the markets uh, where we uh, uh, provide energy and solutions. Indeed. Um, so, Rich, Richard, just to follow up on that, um, the Grandam Institution has a track record via the Climate KLC Accelerator of supporting the creation of, um, I believe, 95 startups uh, in the clean energy space and uh, who went and raised around 200 million pounds and created 1,000 jobs. Uh, so looking, looking back at this journey, uh, what do you think are the main challenges that an average entrepreneur faces in the sector? And uh, what can we learn from the one who succeeded?
Richard, you're on mute. <laughs> ah, schoolboy error. My apologies to the listeners. <laughs> um, what I was saying to myself, apparently, um, is that when we started off, um, we, we began all of uh, this in, in 2011. And clean technology was, uh, you know, it was, it was basically a scourge on, on anybody's investment portfolio. So you would think, well, this is a bad time to start. Why have you decided to do this? Well, I think in my first, you know, my, the first question you've asked me, I kind of gave a response to that. Um, because we should, because this is important. And in fact, Idan has also pointed to, you know, where is innovation going to come from? And my feeling is, well, um, the big companies out there find it difficult to innovate. Their structures and their culture uh, contraindicate um, the, the sort of the swashbuckling entrepreneurial attitudes you need. So we really concentrated on, on the startups. And before we do say anything fancy, um, I would just say this, a good business is a good business, no matter what the economic circumstances, no matter what field they're in. So we managed, I was just having a look at our statistics. So 65% of our startups have gone on to get um, really significant amounts of funding. So many of them are now scaling up, you know, they're, they're, they're getting 50 million dollops of money to set up huge facilities so they they are successful and they're successful because they're really good companies they've got good people they've got good business models good business plans and that's what any accelerator should do so what are the things that you need above and beyond that to be a good accelerator for clean technologies well i think the answer to that is everybody who does innovation in this sphere sits in a value chain somewhere. Some of those value chains currently may not be the value chain relationships you want, but you have to operate within them. And whatever you do must have a net climate impact, a net beneficial climate impact. In other words, you can't just think about your company all on its own. You have to think about the way it integrates with everything else around it in order to really determine it's climate impact. So you're thinking about more than financial impact. You're thinking about climate impact. And then if you're really serious, you recognize that, well, we live in a world in which there are all sorts of other things that we care about. So climate change is a driver for lots of dramatic problems and challenges. But these other challenges need to be addressed simultaneously. So social distress, you know, the, the, we, we, we basically need to have things which are SDG compliant. So I'd say these two things, address the system and address your impact, not just on climate, but on all the other things. And that's where the good companies are. That's where the companies that will have value well beyond this decade, the ones which will become the really big businesses of the future. Thank you, Richard. Um, so Beverly, back to the fund. Um, so can you tell us more on how this public-private partnership came together and how do you plan to operate as a commercially driven fund and in the same time serve the UK's government uh, objectives? Certainly. So um, I think uh, any um, thing of this undertaking obviously takes a long period of time. Um, and so initially, of course, you absolutely have to have the track record in the sector that you're, uh, you're working in. So um, I think it was probably some, you know, 14 years ago when we first set up carbon limiting technologies, one of the pillars of the company was always going to be a venture fund. Um, and so there were, you know, um, 14 years building track record, working with over 350 companies and really proving and demonstrating some of those things Richard was just talking about in terms of a good company and helping those companies succeed and, uh, and, and get, really get to market and scale. Um, kind of closer to, um, you know, as I was doing that, I could see that um, there was a gap in the venture space um, you know, beyond which f f friends and family rounds could go, and yet which, you know, weren't there ready yet for um, 
mainstream venture capital that typically looks for revenue generating opportunities. And um, so I started working and looking for private institutional investors who would be um, willing to cornerstone and back such a fund. Um, at the same time, I've been working with the government for over seven or eight years in terms of the Energy Entrepreneurs Fund. Um, and they conducted their own evidence gathering exercise, which was built into the clean growth strategy that you mentioned, and also the green finance strategy, which suggested that um, there was a gap in this, uh, in this space and that um, you know, what, what they wanted to do was a policy tool to waterfall and um, help other private money come in to, uh, to fund these companies. Um, that uh, all culminated um, together in um, a, a procurement exercise on the, on the government side and, uh, and finally then the signing of, um, of the paperwork um, at the beginning of May. In terms of um, you know, how do we manage the, the fund and at the same time serve the clean growth strategy, well, these two things go completely hand in hand, of course, because um, you have to have, um, you know, for, for um, decarbonisation to happen, you have to have technologies that are commercial, that are scaling and, and moving to market. And the fund is interested in um, investing in commercial, um, disruptive, most promising UK technology companies. So um, the two are completely, uh, completely aligned and, and completely, um, you know, w working together to, uh, to, to, to decarbonize. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so as you all said, um, innovation disruption need to happen in the, in the sector and it ha needs to happen fast. And uh, according to the recent International Energy uh, Agency report, only seven out of 45 clean energy technologies assessed in that report uh, are on target to meet the UN Sustainable uh, Development Goals and the 2015 uh, Paris Climate uh, Change Agreement. Um, so my question is to Richard. So Richard, what are the areas of innovation that you think we should focus on uh, uh, moving forward and how can, be, how can they be more aligned with these important targets? Okay, well, the first innovation is I've actually managed to unmute my, um, myself this time around, so hurrah. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it, you know, the question you're asking is a really big question, and, and there are indeed places you can go to find out the opinions of groups of learned people. I would maybe draw your attention to the Drawdown organization. There's some interesting things there. I don't agree with everything they say, but it's an interesting piece of work, and there are others too. Um, so I'm going to give you a, a personal viewpoint and I'm going to admit that I've probably missed things out and somebody will say, oh, but what about? And I'll go, oh, yeah, wish I'd thought about that one. Um, so let's start. I think the first one is, the, is, is a really boring, but really important. It's decarbonizing heating and cooling in buildings. And so he going to go, yes, absolutely right. <laughs> there you go. Um, it's technically straightforward, all right? So this is not like we can't do this. Um, but the problem has been policies and regulations have just not been stable, they're not been aligned. People have not taken this problem seriously. And I think this is a place where I point my finger firmly at policy people in government and, say, and, and politicians and say, come on, you know, we, this won't go away. You need to get serious. You need to set a stable framework in which all the drivers are there to get us to do this and do it quickly. Um, okay. Uh, by the way, I also believe in regulation here. I think there needs to be a bit of a bite in here. I think there needs to be a, you don't do this and there are consequences. Um, the next one is a bit more obvious, apparently, and that's decarbonizing transport. Um, well, there's been lots of progress in electric vehicles, right? And in fact, um, there are even electric planes have been developed and are, and are flying and it looks great. Um, I personally have worries and my worries are rather simple. Just replacing millions of internal combustion engines with the same number or even more of electric, um, uh, electric vehicles is just doesn't seem the right solution to me because you've got to supply the power for them. 
And when it comes to electric planes, it's even worse. It's a huge amount of charge you've got to put into them. And that means at a time when you need to decarbonize more of the basics of life, you're going for this, you know, you're going for the sector that wants to grow and so on, and you haven't got all the renewables you need to supply them. So I think we may need to just throttle back a little bit on this and maybe think about traveling less, um, like we're doing now, right? Um, and think about other ways of, 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 of leading our lives. So I've got a kind of a worry there that there's a lot going on. Um, the third item on my list, again, it sounds really boring, but it's reducing emissions from agriculture and from the food value chain. Um, clearly, we need to eat. Clearly, we need to drink. We need, we need these things. But the emissions from agriculture are, are, are a major contributor. And we, need, we have got ways of doing that through precision agriculture, through um, better, better practices, agronomical practices, um, from you know better logistics all sorts of things so that's a kind of big fat value chain problem which i think actually doesn't need a lot of government intervention because it's the one place where we as customers and consumers contact are directly in contact with the providers and messages there are already signs of, of, of businesses doing stuff about this um and i'm going to do two last ones i hope i'm not spending too much time but we need to remove carbon dioxide from the air because we are missing all the targets. It's, you know, the, 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 the international energy agencies is right. Um, so we're going to need an emergency plaster to stick over a gaping wound, and that's going to be removing carbon dioxide from the air. And I'm very glad to see over the last month, there's actually been quite a lot of activity in an area that has got no visible commercial market at the moment. But in 10 years time we're all going to want and the very last thing is one of these knock-on effects um, which i'm just going to put in there and say i think we need to pay attention um, biodiversity and ecosystem losses are being driven by climate change and human into human impinging humans impinging on natural systems uh, we cannot allow that to keep on happening and we really need to pay attention uh, to that but i've got no solutions just we should be doing something. Thank you, Richard. Um, so, Avital, after hearing some of the innovation or the new innovation ideas that uh, Richard shared, how, how do you and the other ministries or, for example, the Innovation Authority uh, work to support the right innovation in the sector to emerge? Um, and I think, you know, by now in this stage, it would be really uh, nice to have, um, to share an example or successful case study from the work that you've done. Um, and just to say that I'm, I really encourage our audience to ask questions. So if you have any questions, please write in the chat box. I know also a lot of people submitted questions in advance. So hopefully by the end of this discussion, we'll be able to raise them as well. So Abitel, yeah, back to you. All right, thank you. Um, when we first uh, started to work with the Innovation Authority, uh, our goal as we defined it was uh, to have a program that really increases the number of players in all areas of environmental technologies. Today we are focusing on uh, climate change, which means uh, energy efficiency and uh, renewable energy, but uh, I must say that our program is uh, broader uh, than that. Um, we, when we started, we first conducted the preliminary research and uh, I interviewed uh, all kinds of uh, stakeholders, but, you know, very early in the process, it uh, became um, quite clear that the most pressing need is to support scale-up projects. I mean, all kinds of projects in all the stages of the value chain need support, but it was, uh, it was uh, very clear that the scale-up stage is the most uh, challenging uh, one um, because of uh, two barriers that uh, work together and are especially strong in this uh, stage. It is the financial barrier and the regulatory uh, barrier. Um, so we learned that the phase in which environmental developments tend to fail the most is indeed the scale-up stage. And um, we indeed started uh, with uh, two programs first, the uh, beta site uh, program, and there's the innovation lab program, which 
if we have time, I can elaborate it a little more uh, later. So the beta site program is the one uh, designed especially to deal with uh, the scale up uh, challenge. And uh, first, I, I want to say the most important thing from my uh, perspective is that currently there is an open uh, call for proposals. So any uh, Israeli innovative uh, startups listening uh, right now, uh, you are welcome to check it out on the website of the Innovation Authority and submit proposals uh, in all areas of uh, environmental technology. It's open for uh, submissions until uh, August uh, 2nd. And this, uh, uh, this program, it supports the construction of uh, pilot facilities, meaning uh, initial demonstration of technologies on an industrial scale. The companies, they are uh, selected in a competitive uh, process and they are granted the financial support of up to 40%, uh, uh, sometimes 50% of uh, project uh, cost. We launched this uh, program two years ago and it drew a lot of attention by both industrial sector and clean tech companies. And by now we completed three rounds of uh, calls for proposals. So far we, we reviewed the 76 projects and we chose 26. And as I said, they represent various sectors, energy, water, waste, clean air, green building, etc. cetera. Uh, lots of them indeed are related to uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions, but also to decreasing uh, air pollution, which is uh, uh, an area that is uh, the, the ministry is highly uh, concentrated on. As for uh, specific uh, examples of uh, projects, I'm afraid that due to the rules of uh, secrecy of uh, the Innovation Authority, I really cannot go into specific uh, names. I'll just mention that uh, uh, two interesting examples uh, are um, combining infrastructure with uh, digital uh, um, um, applications and both uh, related to detecting uh, le uh, leakage issues. First one is the drone system that uh, monitors offshore facilities for either regular maintenance issues or uh, detecting uh, leakage of uh, all sorts of uh, substances. Um, and the other one, uh, water related, is the miniature device that monitors the inside of the water pipe uh, systems in order uh, to detect uh, water leak uh, detection. So that's uh, uh, very uh, shortly. And again, uh, startups are welcome to uh, submit their uh, proposals. I'm sure I'm seeing a lot of uh, hand raising after this input, so I'm, I'll share with you soon some of these questions. Right. Um, so, Idan, you mentioned before that uh, live, work, and move are the main pillars that Centric um, uh, Ventures is investing is uh, in, and these, of course, are also the main pillars that are being disrupted by COVID-19. So, how are you adapting your innovation strategy as a result of that disruption? So I, I think the, you know, if we want to see a, a disruptive technology coming and, and making a change, we need to see a disrupted market, right? Uh, and I think with that respect, we have help from COVID because the market have been disrupted in a way that we're, we're all seeing the consequences. And when we think about the way we live, work and move, and I can, uh, uh, and I can say about the way we live, we all live in a different way. I work from home, you can hear my uh, door bell ring uh, because I'm working from home. I have to adapt to the way that I work. I have to manage my energy at home dif in a different way. And com different companies are coming, providing different solutions to manage the energy at home and help, uh, and help us all uh, manage our energy at home. So that's one way of uh, uh, looking at uh, a disruption. The way we work, we all, we've all been disrupted, right? We are no, no longer working from the office as we used to work before. So now we need to find ways to, uh, to have new technologies, to have uh, remote uh, help at home, maybe remote support for energy usage, um, maybe having virtual reality technology that will help us fix things at home uh, instead of uh, sending technician and, and so on. If we talk about the way we move, so suddenly we're not moving. And if we move, we want to do it by using electric vehicle. And electric vehicle is charging at home. So suddenly the charging at home 
is becoming more and more relevant. So as you see, the disruption in all, ways, in all the ways that we live, work and move has been causing and creating opportunities for startups to, to provide solutions. So in, in every disruption, there is an opportunity and there is a, a great option. Thank you. That's really, really interesting, Idan. Um, so I think we talked about challenges before from an entrepreneur perspective. Um, and I think a lot of the entrepreneur attending today will relate to that. But I, I don't see a lot of forums asking investors, what are your challenges? Uh, so Beverly, what, what do you think the main challenges for an early stage uh, investor in the sector? How, how do you think it's different from, let's say, a fintech investor or a, a digital health investor? I think um, there are a number of um, main challenges, um, some of which include, um, you know, evaluating potential performance of, uh, of, of ventures, especially when the markets are still emerging. So if we look at, um, you know, some of the uh, opportunities that Richard was talking about in his kind of five key areas, um, really important, but it's not clear, you know, in terms of who the, um, you know, how those markets are going to grow, how quickly and um, who the key players are going to be, what the value chain is going to look like. And so, you know, that's obviously um, quite uh, quite um, challenging to uh, evaluate um, you know when you're looking to to invest in a you know in, in, a, in a company um, understanding you know with, with like for example building heating and cooling is a is a good example at the moment we understand that you know the gas boiler and um, where the value is created in that chain between the manufacturer and the installer and, and so on um, when we look at changing that to, um, you know, be it heat pumps or solar thermal or um, hydrogen or whatever system that, uh, you know, that, that we look to and distributed energy, the whole value in that um, supply chain changes. And that's where, um, you know, you see incumbents um, can see the, uh, the risk of that. And so you don't know where that will be created and, and also you don't know how that will be distributed. Um, and so, um, you know, that, that's, uh, that's one of the things that um, you need to, to take into account and understand how, um, you know, players in that um, sector are going to react and, and respond to various different innovation as it, uh, as it, as it hits the market. Um, and I think the other um, thing um, particularly relevant to, um, you know, clean tech and clean growth as opposed to, um, you know, fintech or digital media ICT type things is the resource that's needed, both in terms of capital and also in terms of time. So um, many clean tech innovations are a combination of hardware and software. Um, and therefore, by necessity, take a large amount of capital to actually commercialize and get to market. And whereas, um, you know, with a, a software business, um, you know, potentially if, um, you know, if you hit a stone in the road, you have the opportunity to, you know, go around the roundabout and, and, uh, and sort that out. With a hardware business, quite often, um, you don't have that time and that opportunity because it, it will take too long and it's too capital intensive for people to have the patience to uh, you know to be able to kind of ride that ride that journey so i think um you know that's something else that you really need to kind of take into into consideration and and, and to account is looking at you know how much capital is that company going to need ongoing before it actually kind of gets to the place where um you know where it can exit um, so those, I think, are you know some of the kinds of um, issues and, that uh, you know that investors and Idan, you might uh, you know have some comment on that from Centrica. But I think you know those are some of the the thoughts that um, you you have to weigh up and you have to consider when you're looking at opportunities, as much as you want to do them all. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions that I have that are coming in from the audience. Um, so you have to be a UK company in order to uh, submit for the fund, right? Yes, um, you, you do need to be uh, based in the UK and have a significant um, presence in, in the UK. I think one of the things that um, the Israel Hub has been really good at is helping entrepreneurs um, 
land in the UK and the um, Department for International Trade has a global ambassador program which is also set up to help um, companies um, establish um, here. Yeah, exactly. So we have also the, the Department and uh, Trade, International Trade Team at the embassy that have been very helpful in uh, helping Israeli startups uh, open offices and open UK companies. So if anybody from the audience is interested to hear more about that, please just let us know. Um, There's one particular have, company yeah. that's been really successful in that regard. So Teva Motors was a company that came through that program. It joined the Energy Entrepreneurs Fund, which was the grant um, program I was talking about earlier, and received incubation support from Carbon Limiting Technologies. And uh, recently we took them in January actually to uh, Abu Dhabi to the World Climate Innovation Exchange. Um, where they had a very successful set of commercial discussions and, and ongoing negotiations and conversations. So, fantastic. So, I believe there'll be more and more of these examples going forward. Um, uh, so, as we heard from today's discussion, one of the ways we can foster innovation is uh, by building collaboration between the various players in the ecosystem, government, industry, academia, and innovators. Um, Avital, you, you've mentioned your innovation lab, and I specifically want to relate to the ESIL lab, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, I think it's a great example of this joint collaboration. Uh, can you share with us briefly in terms of how the this project come together and how does that serve Israel's uh, objective in you know making up the country as a powerhouse for clean tech technologies? Okay, so um, our interest in this uh, uh, project is that uh, startups will develop solutions that meet the environmental challenges of sectors like energy production, heavy industries, transportation, buildings and pretty much every type of activity that has environmental consequences. Now, in order for startups to do that, they need access to really highly valuable physical assets, as well as uh, mentoring and valuable uh, business uh, guidance. And the Environmental and Sustainability uh, Lab is uh, based on the model of open innovation, which is, uh, of course, it's a model well known in the ICT world, but uh, maybe less in the industrial uh, context. Um, the idea is that an industrial corporation, preferably a joint venture of uh, two or more in this model, is uh, granted a license to operate as an environmental uh, innovation lab. And um, generally, this, this model fits our belief that new technologies should be developed according to actual needs of traditional industry um, in light of environmental uh, challenges. So, um, um, I think it was about uh, 18 months ago, maybe more, we uh, published a call for proposal. Um, um, and uh, we had a few months ago, uh, the, uh, the winning uh, proposal uh, was announced and it is uh, indeed the ESIL, Environmental and Sustainability Innovation Lab, uh, whose uh, manager is actually on the audience. Hi, Ellie. And um, it is, it is supposed to serve as a platform for cooperation between entrepreneurs and uh, manufacturing companies in order to, as I said, to increase the number of, uh, of uh, projects. And um, it is supposed to operate for uh, three to four years. And um, the, um, the operator of the lab uh, receives uh, financing, matching financing from the government for uh, OPEX and the CAPEX. And uh, in return, the operator has to recruit startups to the lab and assist them in their development uh, endeavors. Most of government funding is, of course, uh, designated to support the startups uh, themselves. Um, uh, SL, in particular, uh, is a partnership between uh, B Innovation, which is an uh, innovation platform of Israel oil refinery company. Uh, EDF Renewables, which is a subsidiary of uh, Electricité de France, and the British chemical company, which I assume you know, Johnson uh, Mate, and the inter international partners, they bring their knowledge of international trends and as necessary their physical facilities. From our perspective, the connection between an oil refinery and the renewable energy uh, strand of EDF is of great benefit because naturally, we believe that the fossil business uh, is not economically sustainable 
and we support the idea of traditional energy companies investing in new growth engines such as renewable energies. Fantastic. Uh, Avital, I have a very quick uh, question for you from the audience asking about how, what's the, what are the different responsibilities between the Ministry of Environmental Protection and the Ministry of Energy? If you can give like half a, half a, half a second answer on that. That is one huge question, <laughs> which I really cannot answer it uh, briefly. I assume that the question relates to supporting innovative uh, projects. Yeah. So uh, to some extent, there may be uh, an overlap. Uh, but as I said, um, well, generally, our program is open to all sorts of uh, environmental technologies and maybe projects that uh, the energy element is uh, less um, uh, is smaller uh, uh, than other aspects. We would not uh, have an issue with that. And maybe Ministry of Energy would like to focus on uh, uh, projects where uh, the energy is uh, of uh, um, takes a, a, a bigger part in them. And um, also, I think that the program of the Energy of Ministry is a, a scale-up pilot pro uh, program. And now we have also this uh, innovation lab, which I didn't mention it's in partnership, not only with the Innovation Authority, but also with the Ministry of Economy and Industry. And uh, it is open also for uh, startups of uh, earlier stages, not only scale-up. Thank you, thank you, Avital. Um, so I'm mindful of time. Uh, my next question is for Idan. Um, Idan, talking about collaboration, how do you think Israel's thriving uh, ecosystem can act as a strong partner uh, for the UK in tackling climate change? So, so I think uh, you know Israel doesn't have the uh, market but we do have the technology to deal with no natural resources except for sun, right? So I think our task, and this is task for all of us in this panel, is to bridge the gaps uh, that we have, the, the geographic gaps between Israel and UK, uh, the financial gaps between Israel and UK and funding companies, and bring awareness and bring financial advice, bring financial support, bring the market, bring options, uh, to startups and to, to bridge the gap and allow uh, the technologies to reach the right markets. Uh, Israel has great ecosystem in different verticals, energy and new energy and clean tech is not one of them yet, but it's a growing uh, sector that is being, today it's, it's a little bit undervalued. So a lot of opportunities here for investment Beverly and others, uh, but uh, we're seeing tremendous growth in terms of number of companies that are starting to, to uh, act in Israel, uh, facing Europe, facing the US. Uh, and we're seeing growth in the ecosystem of different activities like the, like the Innovation Forum, uh, like uh, other organizations that are promoting new energy and supporting solutions for uh, you know, uh, decreasing the, the global warming uh, and being more efficient on energy. Uh, so I'm very optimistic about it. Thank you. Um, and Beverly, uh, back to the UK, um, where do you see UK's competitive advantage in, um, in climate change innovation uh, compared to other countries? Um, and how do you think we can strengthen that further by partnering with Israel? So um, I think uh, the UK um, has a clear competitive advantage in uh, the power sector, demand response, um, flexible trading, looking at demand side management um, as, as well as, uh, as, as supply side. And I think that's uh, um, large parts and amounts of that are based on um, data management, data handling, um, sensing, artificial intelligence and so on where I see um, you know, a strength in, uh, in the um, innovation from, uh, from Israel. And so I think uh, you know, there could be uh, potential collaborations and, and, uh, and more, uh, more done there. Um, I think when I look at uh, you know, the UK, we have a very strong automotive sector um, and are doing a lot in terms of um, battery um, and storage uh, innovation and management. So, 
the Faraday Institute um, is focused on uh, looking at and working with um, innovation from universities and also from from corporates and uh, and startup organisations. And I know that uh, you know Israel is very strong in that space as well. I think there um, could be some uh, excellent collaboration opportunities in looking at uh, um, you know electric vehicles and, uh, and and bringing on the next generation of um, of battery technology. Um, you know, not just the performance, but also the, the life cycle piece, the recycling and, and the management, um, you know, through the, through the life cycle of the, uh, of, of the materials. Um, you know, there are other areas where I think Israel is particularly strong that um, the UK could learn from. So in terms of water management and um, looking at, uh, you know, the whole um the whole issue around uh you know pumping of water and efficient use of water and and so on i think um you know there's some useful uh and and um, very valuable you know kind of lessons to uh to learn um there as well um you know the both um, countries are looking quite a lot at solar thermal um believe it or not even in the uk solar thermals that we're uh, we're, we're um, focused on and so uh you know that there's um there's quite some possibility for research programs in in kind of the, the solar thermal field as well thank you beverly and now just a closing question uh, this came from the audience as well and as a really great question uh, so talking about the current situation with COVID-19, uh, Richard, let's start with you. Uh, what do you think will be, who will be the main winners and losing and losers going into a post-COVID-19 reality? And what can you give as a tip for any entrepreneur who's looking at to stop the sector? You're on mute again. Luckily, you didn't hear me swearing there. <laughs> um, so, in fact, I've just answered this online because today um, we wrote a letter to the Prime Minister and, and Ministers about the Green Recovery. So, if you really want to see what I think, <laughs> go and have a look at the letter. Um, the, I, I would like to turn it on its head. Um, climate change is a huge challenge. And that makes it a huge opportunity. It makes it an economic opportunity, but it also makes it an opportunity to shape the future and shape the future in ways which are perhaps fairer, uh, kinder and more prosperous than the, than the present that we've got. So what opportunities are there for startups there? Well, I think Edan and I have already, and, and, and Beverly, we've all kind of indicated that the future is yours because the the change that we need is not going to come from the, the traditional places. Um, so that would be my first plea would be that the change comes from you. Um, I gave an incomplete list, list as the audience was only too happy to tell me, good on the audience, um, you know, go and have a look at the things that really matter and target those. The things which will, which will work right now are what the British government has called very unfortunately shovel ready. Um, well, what they mean by that is things, projects that you could do now, if you were just given enough resource, you could do now. So the other thing I would say is if your ideas are simple and you've already, you've already done your customer discovery, you've already raised your first C round and you've got an A round under your belt, you should be you should be looking at what it is that you can do now and then go and and you know talk directly to your 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 member of parliament you know your innovate uk representative because the you know people are hungry for solutions and they just don't know where to find them so don't wait for them to find you go and meet them go and tell them what you can do there thank you, you Richard. thank you Idan, any tips for emerging entrepreneurs? Yeah, I think in, in any shakeup that you have in, in a traditional in, uh, industry like the energy industry, uh, I think is welcome, right? We're shaking stuff and we're, we're starting to find the cracks and entrepreneurs are uh, so know very well to find the cracks uh, and to, to push for new technologies that will help to 
uh, recover in, in, a, in a faster way, in a better way. Uh, so I think there's a plenty of opportunities now uh, for green recovery uh, with great support and from, from government, with great programs for entrepreneurs. So I think this is a great time to look for solutions for our, uh, the most, uh, uh, the, the most uh, you know, innovative areas in, in the uh, clean tech right now. Thank you. And Beverly? I think I'd um, say that uh, the basics still apply and that, um, you know, hunt for capital is always going to be competitive. So it's really important to focus and really understand who the first customer is and who that early adopter market is. Um, you know, it's really important that the value proposition to that um, first customer is quantified and can be really described in terms of, um, you know, actual um, performance efficiency saving or cost saving, um, you know, whatever it, whatever it might be, it really, it really needs to, uh, to, to hit home on, on that and um, to partner with an industrial partner so that you're developing something that someone definitely wants. Um, you know, maybe they can help you get it to market. Maybe they're part of your supply chain. It is really going to help and accelerate um, success. And so um, I think, uh, yeah, it's a very bright um, in the future. I think Build Back Better is a huge opportunity, um, but you know, don't lose sight of the uh, of the kind of fundamental principles of, um, of of what it is that you need to do, and and uh, and the steps and so on that that you're going to need to take to get there. Thank you, Beverly and Avita. Well, I'm not sure uh, I can really give advice as, uh, to uh, investors or entrepreneurs. I just, uh, to sum up, uh, further, I mean, following the COVID-19, uh, all around the government ministries are uh, talking about uh, how to make a lemonade out of the lemon, how to uh, 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 leverage this uh, opportunity. Just to mention that, uh, there are such huge environmental risks when uh, governments are uh, planning uh, uh, new deals, not new green deals, but like new deals, like back in the 1930. And our job, as well as other uh, environmental ministries and agencies around the world, is to see that uh, we're not rushing into developing uh, huge, expensive uh, infrastructures that are dealing uh, with uh, yesterday's problem and with yesterday's uh, technologies and that uh, we have the environmental uh, uh, principles and the goal uh, in mind. And I must tell you that uh, also we in this uh, stage have to really fight for uh, budgets for uh, keep uh, supporting environmental technologies. So we're doing uh, the best we can and uh, I hope uh, we have, uh, we succeed and uh, everyone answered. Thank you, Abital. And thank you so much for our speakers uh, for making the time to share your valuable input and for our attendees on your fantastic questions and engagement. And I really apologize that we didn't have the time to answer all of them. We'll try to answer some of them by email. I want to also thank our fantastic prosperity team, especially Hadar, Ayel, Daphna, Anat, and Ney. Uh, to our audience, we would love to hear from you on how you think the event went and how we can uh, best shape this collaboration going forward. Uh, we will follow. We will be following up soon in an email summarizing and adding some of the highlights of this discussion and thinking about next steps. Thank you again, and see you next time. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.